so I've been asked to introduce Jacob, and I'll keep it um, relatively swift. Um, I won't go through all the accolades, or we'll be here for quite a long time. Um, aside from being my uncle, Jacob is uh, president of Yad Hanadib, our Israel-focused foundation, currently building a national library designed by Herzog and de Muron. He's chairman of the Rothschild Foundation Europe, focused on Jewish causes in Europe, and he's chairman of the Rothschild Foundation, which, through the Rothschild Collection, supports Wadston. And um, under his leadership, it's become one of the most visited properties in the UK, with about 450,000 annual visitors. It's, it's breathtaking, and um, I will leave it to him to give more details on how dazzling the collections have become. Jacob. I think I, I look for, I need, I'm not sure I need that. And um, Well, look, first of all, thank you for coming. <laughs> Very much. A lot of old and friendly faces. Young and friendly places. <laughs> and thanks, James, and thanks, Chairman. It was very nice, really nice of you. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about Wadston. It's just over an hour from London, on the way to Oxford. And it was created in six years by Baron Ferdinand. And there are no less than six family stately homes. They bought land all in that area of my family, in the Vale of Aylesbury. And it was said that a Rothschild could stand on the roof of any one of them and wave to the others. They <laughs> were closely knit. <laughs> but Ferdinand, though, Watson was more than simply bricks and mortar. He really built it because his wife tragically died in childbirth. She was for Evelina an English Rothschild, and it became Ferdinand's consolation. And he spent the rest of his life, and much of his considerable fortune, amassing this rather extraordinary collection and creating a kind of mad Ferdinand castle, a grand national chateau which incorporates the features of the chateaus of the Loire. So it's a very odd thing to find in the English countryside. It's got, I think it's fair to say, extensive and I think immaculately maintained gardens. You've got a working aviary and an ornamental dairy, and it's filled with collections of fine and decorative arts. I was asked um, by Jacob Fish how many there were, and I asked, and they said 27,000, which I can't really believe. A lot of that must be coins, I think. <laughs> Anyhow, they're all set off. Um, by architectural salvage, stuff that came from France, um, which was made in the 18th century, and which he then bought up uh, from France as husband was really remodeling Paris. <clears throat> as an ensemble, and you might like the story, Watson was extremely influential, particularly in the United States. And you may well know a not dissimilar tour de force at Biltmore, the project began by George Washington Vanderbilt in 1888, and which Henry James described as a thing of the, when he described Watson as a thing, well, as a thing of a high Rothschild manor. This was, this was um, Vanderbilt's house, but of a size to contain two or three mentors and Watson, which is quite an exaggeration. I'm not sure that it's much bigger. The story goes that Vanderbilt visited Watson with his architect Richard Morris Hunt, who went on and on about the finer points of French Renaissance architecture. And after a bit, Vanderbilt got impatient and said, oh, for heaven's sake, just make the place 10 meters longer than Watson. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the grandeur of Watson, I mean, Ferdinand had it was his only interest to build this great big house after his wife died. It was a very far cry from the Judengasse, the Frankfurt ghetto, where the five sons of my uncle Rothschild, the founder of the dynasty, were born and brought up. And you can see there the Frankfurt ghetto and the house which um, they lived in. And it was one of the most disagreeable of all the ghettos in Europe. And the Rothschild family lived in this house, in that narrow 
Sumner Street, which few Christians ever even visited. The gates of the ghetto were opened some 200 years ago now. And one son stayed behind in Frankfurt. The four others were encouraged by their father to extend their rapidly growing business into the major capitals of the day. So they went to Vienna, London, Naples, and Paris. And all five brothers, it's an extraordinary story, became hugely successful and wealthy. And I commissioned a painting you're about to see by an artist called Jean-Marc Winkler, which is a, not a family tree, but an architectural tree, which shows just how affluent the family had become. By the second half of the 19th century, there were 42 ambitious houses built. And the bottom, you can see the house, um, the, the ghetto, right at the very, very bottom there. So those sumptuous creations were spread throughout Europe. And the wonder of Wadsden is that despite two world wars, the most horrible genocide in the history of the world, the depression of the 1930s, inheritance tax and personal tax rates after the war at 80%, that somehow the collection, the gardens, and indeed the estate as a whole, have survived in their entirety and I think it's fair to say they're going from strength to strength today. Most of those 42 have fallen by the wayside. <clears throat> and it's a strange story why it's um, so intact. I mean, for a hundred years, there were no children and no grandchildren of the men. For all four owners were childless. Furthermore, the Systematic and frequent intermarriages resulted in works of art arriving through inheritance uh, rather than departing. And Baron James, who was head of the Paris branch and the youngest of the five sons of our actual Rothschild, gave an astonishingly uninhibited description of the 19th century Rothschild policy of keeping it in the family. I'll quote to you from what he wrote make me smile. In our family, we've always tried to keep love in the family. <laughs> in this sense, it was more or less understood since childhood that children would never think of marrying outside the family so that our fortune would never leave it. <laughs> you couldn't write that today. <laughs> Anyhow, the change from being a private house to a public institution the mixed marriage between the National Trust and my family, I think it's fair to say, has been a successful and happy one, and I believe unique of its kind. And last year, we had 450,000 visitors. <clears throat> the foundation, our foundation provides the financial support and lends a pretty large number of works of art to the property. And then we started building new buildings, and we've got two contemporary buildings on the estate. One is Windmill Hill, which you can see there, which houses our archive. And it has a collection, a growing collection of contemporary art, both inside and outside. More recently, we built this house, faced in flint, and apparently emerging from the depths of the earth. And we were very pleased and honored when it won the RIVA prize for the House of the Year in 2015. And we now, it's a happy ending for this bit of the story, we now have a joint fellowship scheme with the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, with a visiting scholar spending some months at the Flint House and some months in Los Angeles. And many of you may know this in the audience, but it's quite interesting that last week our fellow our fellow this year was a guy called Tom Campbell, <laughs> many of you in this room will know, who was the director of the Metropolitan yeah. Museum, and left in somewhat unhappy circumstances. He's now been appointed as the director of the San Francisco Museum. <clears throat> now, I want to tell you something about the members of our family who, through Wadsden, have been particularly involved with Israel and the Jewish community. <clears throat> Jimmy Rothschild, who really inherited the property out of, out of the blue. He'd come 
which is the son of Baron Edmond de Rothschild, who had established settlements in Palestine to give a new life to persecuted Russian Jews. He, out of the blue, inherited Wadston from Ferdinand's sister, Alice. He left Paris to England after the Dreyfus case. And his wife, Dolly, helped Heim Weizmann in his stupendous efforts to establish the State of Israel by connecting him into the establishment of Great Britain. When she was only 19, Weizmann wrote to her 33 letters uh, during the course of the year. He didn't know anybody. He was a fairly impoverished uh, chemist in Manchester. And she had contacts and introduced him to people like Lord Crewe and Lord Rosebery. And I think it's fair to say that the Balfour Declaration might not have happened without her and her husband's support. Jimmy Rothschild, throughout his life, was a passionate supporter of the Jewish community. <clears throat> and when condition, conditions for Jews in Austria and Germany became intolerable in the 1930s, some of you may know this, the British government made provision for 10,000 unaccompanied children to be given refuge, known as the kinder transport. <clears throat> and Jimmy and Dolly offered to help by providing a home for 30 of those children at Wadston. It was literally a last minute escape. Now Jimmy and Dolly were also childless, and in effect those 30 children became theirs. And interestingly, almost all of them had successful careers. One, for example, was a golf professional, and another looked up to the estate of a British Earl. On my side of the family, the first Lord Rothschild became the first Jewish peer in 1885, and his successor, Walter, was a deeply eccentric individual, <laughs> with, a, with a passion for collecting specimens of natural history, including drowned horses. You can see him riding one of them. Butterflies, beetles, birds, and fleas. And if you come to the Wadsland area, you can see his collection at an extraordinary museum at Tring, which was my side of the family's property. It's only about 10 miles from Wadsland. And surprisingly, very surprising really, given his temperament, he was converted to Zionism <coughs> by my Hungarian grandmother, Rosica, and he fell under Weizmann's spell. And he was seen as the lay leader of the Jewish community, and the Balfour Declaration was therefore addressed to it. Now, my late cousin left me with responsibility for Wadsden and for our foundation, Yad Hanadi, which James mentioned, which is based in Jer Jerusalem. And today we continue our forebears' work there, since the building of the Knesset, which Jimmy Rothschild was responsible for and which was dedicated in 1966, the Foundation's activities have covered a wider and wider field. For example, the building of the Supreme Court, you can see some of them there, yeah. some of the people involved there, the Open University, the Center for Education and Technology, the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies, the Jerusalem Music Center, and the Environmental Health Fund. <clears throat> now, today, we're deeply involved with the renewal of the National Library of Israel. I even had lunch today with the architects. It's a wonderful, it's going to be a wonderful building, Herzog of uh, And I think for the first time, really, in history, and thanks to the internet, uh, Jewish communities throughout the world will be able to be in contact with another. So I think it's going to be a tremendous project. Now, our commitment um, to Jewish life has continued for eight generations. And again, James, I want to thank you both for your support this evening and for your support of Wadsden. It's done us some very good pictures. And also as a trustee of Hanadi. Happy you're here tonight, and thank you for what you've said. My hope, of course, is that Wadsden will prosper as a place and as a center for our family's continuing efforts in the United Kingdom and Israel for generations to come. Hopefully, 
<laughs> some of you will come to Wadsmith's collection of its gardens, and a room we're creating which will show the family's role in the Balfour Declaration and our support for Israel. You'll see there are models of the Supreme Court building and of the library building, which is now under construction, as you've seen. At the Windmill Hill building, you can see early documents, photographs and correspondence relating to Baron Edmond's settlements in Pika. That was the Palestine Jewish Colon Colonization Association. Which, have been, which was set up to support those early settlements. Now look, inevitably, because of time, I've only given you a snapshot, perhaps snapshots long enough, of our family, the property of Watson, and our relationship with Israel. There's so much more to say, and even more to see, so I hope you might come to Watson. And meanwhile, thanks for coming this evening. This event, I'd like to say, couldn't have happened without the support of Jacob Fish, who has connections <coughs> with us and with many of the guests here. He's a vital link between the National Library of Israel project and Wadston. And then I'd like to thank Sotheby's. A hundred years ago, we used to own 25% of Sotheby's. <laughs> and you still can. In the office of <laughs> Then I... I'd like, to, I'd like to thank Tad Smith, your chairman, Natalie Conboy, and Jennifer Roth for so generously, and host, uh, for so generously hosting us and welcoming this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>